from the Diary of an Astral Projector by Scaredy Cat 666. I'm probably the most boring person you can imagine. I work in an unnecessary office, doing unnecessary things. My cubicle, plain as white bread, is uncontaminated by any personal belongings and my desk is always tidy. I have no friends, no family, and when I go home, I watch the news, eat something, and then go to bed. On the weekends, I take walks outside in order to absorb enough vitamin D to function properly. I have no preference in music, movies, food, people, or sexuality. All is fine with me, and I don't care for money, recognition, or love. I overheard my colleagues talking about me, how weird it is that I seem to have no interests at all, and how rarely I show emotions. Exchanging theories about how I may suffer from depression, autism, or PTSD. Now I tell you, none of that is true, for what they don't know is what I do when the day is over. You see, when I turn off the lights, lie in bed and close my eyes, I leave my body and start travelling. It's called Astral Projection. I've done some research but I've lost interest, for what I've read on the internet is but the tip of the iceberg for me. Each night I or my astral body rises, I watch myself sleep. I walk or glide or float out of my tiny one room apartment and go anywhere I want. I don't have to concentrate, meditate or anything. From when I was a child, I was able to do this without any effort. I flew through the clouds. I dove to the bottom of the ocean. I traveled the world, watching the northern lights, visiting the old cities of Europe, roaming the coast of Japan, observing the animals in the jungle. I once tried to reach the moon, but it took too long and I had to get up for work. The thing I enjoy most, however, is people watching. Since walls pose no obstacle for me, and nobody can see or hear me, I am able to watch whomever, wherever, and whenever I want. I am aware that my little hobby rules some substantial moral questions, so I made a rule. When I'm in my physical body, I am not to act upon any information that I've learned while I was travelling. I have to act as though I only know what I am able to know from my work in life. I am a quiet, neutral observer. Now this is easier said than done. I've seen my share of criminal activity, theft, rape, murder and so on. In some cases, I broke my rule and anonymously reported it, in some I didn't. In order not to have to face these moral dilemmas, and since I don't see myself as a superhero, I try to avoid areas where things like these happen more often. Also, I don't go to active war zones. I know that there is not much I can do about wars in different parts of the world, so in this case, it's easier to uphold my non-engagement rule, but some things I've seen there, I'd rather unsee. In addition, I try not to observe people I know closely. It can get really hard not to act upon private information about your work colleagues and use them for your advantage somehow, even unconsciously. I do have my favourite people to watch though. Some of them I watch for a few weeks, some for longer. Lately I've been visiting a young woman, living alone. From what I've gathered, her husband had recently died. How? I couldn't say. However, it was clear that she was in mourning. She wore black every day, spent a lot of time in her bed looking at his picture crying. Her apartment was a mess, but she did the best she could to keep it together, removing everything that rots but unable to do more. There were no new messages on her phone when she got home, nobody visited her, and she never went out. Something about her touched me, that grief, that unthinkable reality of having lost a loved one. She must have imagined herself with him for the rest of their lives. Now her life was empty, and her world seems utterly devoid of any meaning. I don't know why, but sometimes I try to imagine me comforting her. When she sat at the table, eating her pre-prepared dinner, I sat across from her, keeping her company. When she cried, I spoke kind words to her, and sometimes when she laid in bed crying, I, I laid next to her, stroking her hair, holding her until she drifted off to sleep. Slowly but surely, I realised that what I was doing was weird. Not in a voyeuristic sense, I've made my peace with that a long time ago. Since my presence, my gestures and words of comfort couldn't reach her. Who was I doing this for? Was I just soothing my bad conscience for watching her? 
taking part in a life without being invited? Or was there more? Why was I watching her in the first place? What was it about this lonely person that fascinated me? About this young woman, disconnected from the world, living more like a ghost than like a human being? I had to find out. Over time, I spent less and less time watching other people, until I visited only her, every night. As my obsession grew, I started to notice small things. One time, while I was lying next to her in bed and put my arm around her waist, it seemed like she, in her sleep, tried to hold my hand. Sometimes when she was sitting alone in her room, she suddenly turned her head in my direction. She was looking right through me, but on her face, there was an expression of bewilderment. It looked like she felt that there was somebody watching her. I was unsure if I was just imagining, but my feelings of being uninvolved slowly faded, and I became a little nervous. Then one evening, she came out of the shower, wiped the steam off her mirror, and looked at herself. And all of a sudden, her eyes met mine. Richard, visibly agitated, she called out her dead husband's name before turning her head and seeing nothing but a blank wall. Did she somehow feel my presence? My heart sank. Maybe I should have read more about what I'm doing. As my uneasiness grew, things started to change. She spent less time in grieving apathy. She tidied up her apartment, opened the blinds, went out more, read more, especially about occult and supernatural stuff, and most unsettling, she started talking to her dead husband on a regular basis telling him about her day, how she missed him, what she was thinking about, etc. Maybe I should stop, I thought. This thing was messing me up. I couldn't concentrate anymore. I got distraught from work. I neglected my daily duties and my once tidy life became a mess. Before long, I made a decision. I had to stop visiting her. No good could come of it. The night came where I would last visit her and say goodbye. As I entered her apartment, there she was, sitting at the table, smiling, as if she was waiting for me. Even though I knew, or hoped, she couldn't see me, I sat down at the table facing her. I took a deep, astral breath, looking for the right words to tell her that I won't be coming back, hoping that even though she couldn't hear me, the fact that I told her would give me some peace of mind. Before I could utter a single word, she spoke. Before you say anything, Richard, let me set the mood. With that, she lit some candles on the table. Then she stood up and turned off the light. I've been missing you so much, Richard. You cannot imagine. I cried and cried, feeling so utterly alone. My life became so empty when you left. It felt like a big black hole. Honestly, I've been thinking about how I could end it all, just to be together with you again. Then I realized that you're not actually gone. You're right here with me. I can feel your presence. Sometimes I can see you out of the corner of my eye, and when I lie in bed, I can feel your warmth beside me. She continued talking while she grabbed a handful of salt in the kitchen and made a line on the floor in front of the door, connecting her apartment to the hallway. What the hell? First, I felt so happy that you were here with me, but over time, I started asking myself why. Why would you leave me just to haunt me now? How could you do this to me? Her voice started trembling. You said that you loved me, that you'd stay by my side, how could you just leave me like this? Lost and alone, with no one to talk to, no one to love, how could you just leave without saying a word? She was crying now. You could have talked to me. I had no idea how you felt, how depressed you were. Don't you trust me? We could have worked something out. I would have found somebody to help you. We could have overcome it together. How could you just kill yourself? Then she took some deep breaths and calmed herself. It doesn't matter now. I thought I knew you, but apparently I didn't. I don't know anything anymore, but I want to show you something. You might have noticed that you can't leave this apartment. The salt acts as a barrier, so you'll have to listen. Her words sent a shiver through my spine. I got up at once and tried to pass through the door, but I couldn't step over the salt. Also, I was unable to pass through the ceiling or the walls. Apparently the salt had some symbolic power sealing the room. Damn, I should have read more. The sudden realization came over me like a shock. I was trapped in here. This thing got way too real. Do you even realize what you did to me? 
Do you even think about me before you slit your wrists? Do you know what it feels like to find the dead body of your loved one? To see it bloated, bloody and lifeless? Can you imagine what that does to you? I can't get the image out of my head. I see it every time I close my eyes. I dream of it every night. Do you know how that is? No, of course you don't. You don't care. Well, I will show you. With that, she got up off the table and grabbed the noose that was hanging from her ceiling and put it round her neck. Well, wait, I yelled. You left me, Richard. Without even saying goodbye, you left me. But you can't leave me now. You'll have to watch. You'll have to watch me die and rot. You will learn what it feels like. And then we can be together again. No way, I'm not. I love you, Richard. See you on the other side. With that, she kicked over the table she was standing on. The rope tightened around her neck, her feet dangling in the air. I screamed for help. I tried to leave and go back to my body so I could call an ambulance, but it was to no avail. All I could do is sit there and watch her struggle. Her face became dark red. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head and saliva was dripping from her mouth as she slowly suffocated. After about five minutes, she finally stopped twitching. Now she was just hanging there. Morning came. The birds were chirping and she was still just hanging there. I guess I was in shock. It took me a whole while until I was able to formulate a thought. How long would it take for somebody to find her? Days passed and I was still trapped in this small apartment with only a body hanging from the ceiling that kept me company. She started to turn grey. Her lifeless eyes became milky white. Dark purple veins and arteries became visible through the skin and flies started to gather around her. And all I could do is watch her rot. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't leave and I knew that this was all my fault. Most of the time, I sat huddled together in the dark corner where I didn't have to look at her. And yes, I was crying, silently begging for somebody to come and get me out of there. Imagine being trapped like this, with your sin hanging, rotting, looking at you with its dead unforgiving eyes. I can't take it. Please somebody help me for the love of God. After 12 days, finally, I heard a knock at the door. Miss, please open up. Police. I heard the lock turning. In stepped a policeman holding a handkerchief over his nose and mouth, followed by paramedics. Jesus Christ, one of them said. Their steps blurred the line of salt on the floor. Now was my chance. I passed through the door and let my feeling guide me to my physical body as fast as possible. Buildings, streets and people passed me by at an unbelievable speed until I finally found myself emerged into my flesh. I woke in a hospital bed. Apparently, my obsessive punctuality led my superiors to become suspicious pretty quickly when I didn't show up for work without calling in sick. Authorities found me at home lying in bed. I was brought to a hospital and they thought me comatose. Little did they know that I was actually wide awake the whole time, trapped in hell. Now I'm lying here, traumatized, afraid to fall asleep, with images of a rotting corpse flashing through my head, feeling like shit. But I'm alive and back in my body. The beeping sounds the machines make prove it. But what is this odd feeling? Ever since I work, I feel, I feel like I'm being watched. I think I see somebody out the corner of my eye, but when I turn my head, they're gone. Who is this?